Good morning, Abita. <laughs> so I'm going to launch right in to basically summarize the essence of the Hola movement in less than 20 minutes. I heard a talk by the Dalai Lama in 1990. And he said, if you want to understand the deepest secrets of the universe, there are four steps. First, explore the outer visible universe. Second, explore the inner invisible universe. Third, explore the relationship between the two. And fourth, through these three, you can come to know the deepest secrets of the universe. The bottom line is that Western science sees the first step and focuses on the first step the visible universe. And then Eastern science, if you will, the contemplative meditative traditions, focus more on the inner worlds. And then the relationship between the two is addressed in the esoteric <coughs> wisdom traditions. But very, very few scientists have actually excelled in all three. And David Bohm is such a scientist. What is the Holo movement? The Holo movement was defined by David Bohm, the cosmos is a single unbroken wholeness in flowing movement in which everything is connected to everything else. And uh, let me say a little bit about David Bohm before I give you some visuals of what the whole of movement is. Um, Bohm was a remarkable pioneer of quantum physics. And he basically was a close colleague of Einstein's. He worked closely with Einstein at Princeton. And both of them challenged the standard so-called Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, which was based on statistics. And Bohm did the impossible in 1952. He reformulated quantum mechanics based on non-locality, this intrinsic interconnectedness of the universe. Einstein didn't like it. Einstein didn't like non-locality because Einstein felt nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Whereas Bohm was saying, based on quantum physics, that everything is automatically, immediately interconnected. And Einstein famously dismissed this as what he called spooky action at a distance, or in German, spookhafte Fernwirkung. <laughs> Pretty good mouthful there, huh? <laughs> spookhafte Fernwirkung. <laughs> so Einstein didn't like it. And, uh, and then, nor did, uh, and I actually then, what Bohm then did, based on this thought experiment called the EPR paradox. Bohm actually redesigned Einstein's experiment to create an experimental design that could actually be tested using photons. And so this is what Bohm did, and uh, that created a possibility of actually testing this. And then along came John Bell, a physicist in Berkeley, very inspired by Bohm's work. And he also didn't like non-locality. He said, I'm going to get it out of there. And he tried for 12 years, and he couldn't do it. And by his own account, Bohm forced him to realize non-locality is foundational to the essence of physics and to quantum physics. And that led him to develop his famous Bell's theorem. Bell's theorem was then tested in a series of experimental tests, beginning in 1972 with John Clauser, then uh, continuing with Alain Aspect in 1982, which is when I started tracking this as a young postdoc. And I was very excited because I saw the potential for this to prove essentially what the mystics had claimed for millennia, that there is a fundamental inherent oneness to the cosmos. And then these experiments were continued by Anton Zeilinger and his colleagues in the 2010s. And in 2022, 70 years after Bohm's 1952 paper, the Nobel Prize was awarded to these experimentalists who prove that non-locality is real and prove that Einstein's dreaded spookhafte Fernwirkung is actually real. And this is the basis of what is today's second quantum revolution. And in my view, as I said, it's the strongest scientific validation of the inherent oneness of all that is, which the mystics have proclaimed across the traditions. So we have this whole essence of Bohm also not only was a consummate physicist, he was a deep spiritual seeker. He really delved into that step too. He had extensive dialogues with Krishnamurti, the Dalai Lama, and other spiritual masters. And in his quest for 40, after 40 years of deep research and deep earnest inquiry, 
he came up with the Holo movement as his kind of final theory. Along the way, he developed the theory of the implicate order, which is essentially the science of the invisible realms and the explicate order, and the interpenetration of the two, which he then later called the Holo movement, as essentially his final uh, articulation of the nature of reality. And finally, I'll mention here that Bohm was largely ignored in his lifetime. Oppenheimer uh, famously said at one point, if we cannot prove David Bohm wrong, we must all agree to ignore him. <laughs> now, this is an astonishing, un astonishingly unscientific attitude, but it is common. It's, it's called the solitude of genius. When you are so far beyond everyone else, Mozart had the same problem. Um, they just can't go with you where you have gone. And I don't know if any of you, how many of you ever met David Baum? Just you. Oh. <laughs> and I had the great privilege of meeting with him and sharing these ideas with him. And the qualities that first struck me so strongly were his humility and his earnestness and his kind of reverence for reality. And that was such a beautiful quality to see in a scientist. It impacted me very deeply, and he encouraged me strongly to keep going with these ideas. The explicate order is essentially a synonym for the physical universe, the vast, visible, 100 billion galaxies, each of which has 100 billion stars. The implicate order is everything else. Now, when we first hear about this, it's natural to think that the explicate order is the main reality, right? 100 billion galaxies, each one has 100 billion stars, and the implicate order is some kind of ethereal informational field floating around. But for Bohm, it was precisely the opposite. The explicate order, he said, is like the foam on the waves of the ocean. It's ephemeral, it's vast, sure, it extends all over the Earth, but it's a thin surface phenomenon. And the implicate order is the ocean itself. So I really want you to hold that parallel because the entire visible cosmos is like this thin foam on the ocean of spiritual reality. So the implicate order is present everywhere, visible nowhere, extends throughout space and time, but also far beyond space and time. It represents the unseen, that which is beyond the five senses in the mind. And it has multiple ontological levels, which we won't go into today, called the super implicate orders. Now, one of the most compelling aspects of the holo movement is the holo part itself. What does that mean? It means that reality has a holographic or a fractal structure. The simplest example of this is the Mandelbrot set. Um, and that, you can see on the bottom, maybe barely there, is a, is a simple nonlinear iterative equation. You may, may remember in high school mathematics when you had a little equation like y equals x squared and you plot the graph and you get a parabola like that. This is similar, but it's in the complex plane. It's an iterative process. And here's the graph that you get from plotting that equation. It's a very complex uh, structure. And now if we blow it up, we're going to zoom in to have a closer look at what this is. Okay, and then again, we're zooming in. <coughs> the deep structure, now into the center, again zooming in. At this point, we're about one million times magnified. Uh, there at the center is the, the star you see at about 10 million times magnified. Next slide. At that star, we magnify the slide. And we see this. And if you see that black dot at the center, we magnify that. And voila. We see an exact replica of the original 136 million times magnified. Oh wow. So this oh, is a back. modern scientific, we're coming back to it, don't worry. <laughs> Fractals are a modern scientific discovery of the ancient hermetic principle of correspondence, as above, so below, as within, so without. The microcosm replicates the macrocosm. Now, we have lots of examples of this throughout the natural world. A fern, for example, a single leaf is a miniature version of the fern. Broccoli. Okay, so here you have the uh, broccoli. Each nodule of that broccoli is a miniature of the whole. Tree branches. A, a single branch has the same structure as the trunk with all of its mini branches. Lightning. Each one of these, it's in, in science it's called scale invariance. The structure is the same regardless of the scale at which we look at it. 
Sometimes it's called nested sets of self-similar structures. These are all scientific <coughs> names for what we're observing here. The eyeball, the, at the top is the iris, and these are the blood vessels in the eyeball. The blood vessels have a fractal structure. The trachea in the lungs have this same scale invariance, this same fractal structure. Uh, here on the left, we have image of brain cells. The scale is a few microns. Here on the right, we have astrophysicist's conception of the universe. This is thousands of light years across. Notice the as above, so below. So here is my hypothesis. In precise analogy to the mathematical fractal, consciousness itself has a holographic or fractal structure. And Rumi said it best, as he often does, the secret turning in your heart makes the entire universe turn. So now we have a video to show you if you were asking for a more detailed version. Now here what we're doing is we're taking a deep dive into the interior structure of this mathematical object. Again, this is simply a mathematical structure and what we're doing is we're taking a dive in here and think of this as looking at the interiority of the holo movement itself. And as we go in, you can see the incredible complexity and richness of this. All of this is part of the innate inner structure of the holo movement. And what you're going to see in a moment is that miniature version of the original is going to appear. Because embedded within this vast cosmos are precise miniature replicas of the, of the whole. And so the part contains the whole. And here it comes. You can see it right there. There it is. And then we just keep going and we keep diving into this. This goes for 200 and 70 orders of magnitude, this particular video. And it just keeps going and going and going. So it's infinities within infinities within infinities. This is what I like to call the internet of the heart. The bottom line is that each of us has access to the full of an infinity of divinity through our own hearts. You are not just a drop from the infinite ocean. You are the infinite ocean contained in a single drop. Yes. And so, therefore, oneness with the infinite divine is universal. And I'll just sketch it out here. You can see the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, the Gospels, the Sufi scriptures, the Psalms, the identity of the soul with the divine being is proclaimed across the mystical tradition. Bottom line in all of this is this, the inmost essence of the human being is none other than the transcendent essence of divinity, of the divine being, regardless of what name we call it, Dharmakaya, Tao, Goddess, Brahma, Great Spirit, that identity is the deepest truth of who we are. As it was said in the Rig Veda, Ekam Sat, the truth is one. Sages call it by different names. Now, a key path to realize this truth is through the unity of dualities. And this is, of course, the classic example of yin-yang. It really reflects a cosmic polarity, symbolized by the complementarity of yin and yang. And you'll notice I've made each of the little circles there a miniature yin and yang, because this itself has that same holographic fractal structure. And across the traditions, the essence is the real secret of yin and yang is neither yin nor yang. It's their sacred union that transcends both. And there is an ecstatic congress at play in the intricacy of all dualities and polarities, explicate and implicate, matter and spirit, solar and lunar, temporal and eternal, masculine and feminine. And when we unite these dualities, we come into the fullness of spiritual realization. And so when the implicate and explicate orders unite, we have this transcendent unity of flowing oneness, which is the holo movement. And we see this across the traditions in Hermeticism, the union of the sun and the moon, in Tantra, the cosmic dance of masculine and feminine divine that has already been referenced here this morning. In alchemy, in the Western tradition, same thing. 
the basic uh, androgynous nature of masculine and feminine in each one of us. And when we unite those dualities, as Jesus said in the non-canonical gospel of Thomas, make the two become one, the inside like the outside, then we enter the kingdom of heaven. So I want to close with this image. Do any of you recognize this image? This was published on the front cover of Nature in September 2014. It is a composite image of the nearest 100,000 galaxies to our own. So if you see that little you are here, right here, that is the Milky Way. And every dot in this diagram is a galaxy, and every little line is the movement of that galaxy through space. And what they noted very interestingly is that these 100,000 galaxies are all converging on a very unique structure. And even in the scientific journal Nature, they said, this structure here looks quite a bit like a heart. Now, if you, to give you a better idea of that structure, here we have the outlines of that structure in a 3D. Notice the shape of that Laniokea supercluster, how those lines precisely map onto the human heart. So the moral of this story, the fundamental nature of the whole movement, if you want to go to the infinite, whether you go outwardly through the cosmos or inwardly through spiritual inquiry, you have to go through the heart.